Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 11th, 2024. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of The Homebrew Recipe Bible, Methods of Modern Home Brewing, and How to Brew Seltzer, joins me to taste my Belgian single and to formulate a recipe for a hoppy raw ale. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And many thanks to the new Patreon subscribers who are signing up every week. And those of you who are up in your participation, uh, your help is very much appreciated. Financial supporters have already seen the video that I'll post to the public later this week. It's the one where Steve and I compare stouts made with oats. Mine was brewed with oat malt, and Steve brewed his uh, with a bit of uh, brown sugar and maltodextrin along with flaked oats. Both beers were tasty, and it was fun to taste side-by-side the two approaches to the general style. Financial supporters also get a behind-the-scenes video of my brewing the oat malt stout and recipes for both beers. We had a big time with friends over the past weekend in anticipation of the total solar eclipse. Hiking, drinking beer, eating, drinking beer, playing games, drinking beer, and also Experiencing the uh, experiencing the uh, the eclipse and then drinking beer, uh, I <laughs> I also breathed in about a pound and a half of pollen I think uh, to my estimation, which is why my voice is not completely up to stump today. Desiree and Dave even joined us from Tulsa along with Desiree's sister Janice. Uh, it's always fun to spend time with them. I'm glad they got the chance to come down. They say there's going to be another total uh, solar eclipse here at the house. Uh, in 21 years. But I hope I get the chance to see another one before then. I've got a plan to travel, though. Uh, Chris and I are going to formulate the recipe for my hoppy raw ale in this show that you're about to listen to, and I've already brewed it, as you you probably heard. I fermented it with the seasonal yeast from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Yeast. A37 Pog is Ebegarden Kvik. And... Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to pitch into this beer, inspired by my conversation with Mika Leitinen. I pitched it at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 32C, which still sounds crazy to me, uh, but it got to work really quickly. In fact, just a couple of hours after I pitched it, the airlock was going, so bubbling by supper time. I fermented inside in uh, the guest bathroom, so I didn't maintain that temperature. However... I did get some nice lemony characteristics from the beer that I think are coming from the yeast. Uh, Imperial says fermenting pog at the upper end of the uh, temperature range gives you big tropical fruit aromas of pineapple and guava. I've got another pouch or two on hand that I plan to use when it heats up a bit on the summertime hot porch. You know we love Imperial yeast with 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open packet. My stir plate is dusty because they don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. And my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. By supper time with this beer, ask your local homebrew store about A37 Pog and check out all the dependable deliciousness at imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's drink a beer and formulate another one with Chris Colby. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on the show. We're going to drink, and thanks for giving me a, ch- a chance to drink beer in the middle of the afternoon <laughs> for work. <laughs> Day drinking, yeah. Mm. <laughs> there are worse things than talking yeah. to your friend about beer while, yeah. you're, while you're drinking some beer. <laughs> I'm terrible at day drinking, though, <laughs> as, as you discovered when we went to New Zealand. <laughs> It just takes practice. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm getting some today. So awesome. <laughs> I don't know. If, when you say you're terrible at it, does it mean, <laughs> mean that you're good at it? I, what is, I, <laughs> it's kind of one of those things. <laughs> it, it means, yeah. Like back in graduate school, when I first got there, there was this, this Canadian guy I knew and he – you would ask me a lot, like, hey, do you want to go to the pub and have a beer for lunch? 
And at first I was like, yeah, sure. You know, look at me. I'm in a big city now. I'm having a beer for lunch. After a beer for lunch, I just sat there for the rest of the afternoon like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. I can't even have a beer if anything needs to be done in my life. <laughs> I need to get it finished and then open a beer. Yeah, yeah. Or it's not getting done. And then you solve all the world's problems before supper time. <laughs> <laughs> and create some as well. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that very much. <laughs> not lately, at least, but... <laughs> Well, what we're sipping on is the thing that we formulated last time we got together, and it's a Belgian single. And so while you're yeah. si while you're sipping and evaluating, I'll I'll tell people about the recipe. Uh, this is a about a two and a half gallon batch or nine point five liters, and the yield was twenty one bottles, twenty one twelve ounce bottles. So this was a stovetop uh, brew. Uh, into three and a half gallons of water or uh, 13.25 liters at 158 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 C, I put three and a half pounds or 1.6 kilograms of avant-garde pills, 12 ounces or 340 grams of wheat malt, and uh, I mashed at 152 degrees Fahrenheit or 67 C for 60 minutes. And I put that... At, I preheated my oven and put the kettle in the oven to maintain the temperature. And then during the boil, I added 12 ounces or 340 grams of just table sugar at the beginning of a 60-minute boil. Along with that, I added 8 grams of nugget at 14.1% alpha acid. And these were just hops that I had in the in the freezer that I just needed to, you know, get rid of. Uh, then at the end, at Flame Out, I had uh, 14 grams of Herzbrucker at 2.1% alpha acid. And uh, I pitched, and I didn't use imperial yeast because this is a small batch. Um, and I kind of wanted to under pitch as well. So I used half a pack of Fermentus BE256. Uh, so that's about five grams of that. Uh, original gravity, 1048. Final gravity, 1002 for an ABV of 6%. Uh, and according to my the calculator, I used 100 and, 159 calories for a 12-ounce mm. pour. So what do you think? I think it turned out really well. Um, it it pours. It's I mean, it's a Belgian, so it doesn't need to be super clear. It pours mildly clear. Uh, it's got a lot of a lot of bubbles in it. Uh, it smells good, you know. The aroma is real nice. Um, very dry. I, I and I mean I as I've said a million times, I like my beers on the dry side, so I really like this. And uh, at the ABV, it is you know it's kind of a uh, it hides that pretty well. I mean, it doesn't taste like that it's that strong, and I, which I, can be deadly. Yeah, <laughs> it's very very easy to drink. Uh, I put five of those little aspirin-sized um, carbonation tablets instead of the, you know, they say four for just a, you know, regular carbonation, five right. for a little bit more. And I think that worked out well. Um, it doesn't seem over-carbonated at all, and it's no. nice nice and fizzy for the style. Yeah, the, I mean, the high carbonation and uh, the low gravity um, – yeah, combined to make it uh, like a very dry beer. When I saw that the that the original gravity was ten forty eight, I thought to myself, "Well, good, you know, there'll be a nice little, you know, four, you know, five percent beer." No, <laughs> if, yeah. If, if the yeast had other ideas, um, what do you think about the yeast character? Yeah, I I, I think it's good. I mean, and there's a definite um, sort of you know Belgian yeast character to it. With a little bit of the phenolics, but it's not, you know, it's not knocking me over. Mm -hmm. it, it it balances nicely with with the rest of the the beers. You know, it's not uh, strongly hoppy. You know, it's not strongly alcoholic, or or super malty. You know, it's just nice and balanced. And I think the yeast character rounds that out nicely. Yeah, it's and it's and it's gotten. I've, I've been sampling these. You know, I let's see. I I bottled this on. Uh, February 17th, and now it's March 11th uh, that we're tasting these. Uh, you know, and over the past few days, I've been sampling randomly 
and the yeast character is actually in, increasing over time, you know, mm. as, as maybe you'd expect. But um, uh, as the you know priming sugar is completely consumed, uh, but yeah, I like it a lot. I think it's very drinkable. It's got enough of that um, sug- you know sugary. Uh, you can tell. I think that uh, I can tell that it's that it's had sugar in it. Um, even though it's just table sugar and it's got no sort of flavor on its own, really, um, it's super dry. Uh, it's uh, it does taste a little bit on the strong side. You can tell that you're drinking a beer, um, <laughs> but uh, but I think I think it's really nice. I don't know, you know, I don't know how you know true to the quote unquote style it is, but I th- I think it's really really good. I'm I'm happy with this one. Yeah. Well, I mean, the basic idea between behind a Belgian signal is it's a very, you know, sort of quaffable, if you want to use that word, uh, beer. You know, it's it's something to have when you're having more than one beer. And yeah, this could, uh, I could easily have more than one of these. Oh, and I, I texted you. I put a I put a screenshot of our text exchange on Instagram. I texted you and I said Belgians. <laughs> I said Belgian singles headed your way, and you said you're talking about beer, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh yeah, it kind of looks like spam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Belgian singles in your area. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, at the, at at my age, this is the kind of Belgian single I want right here. This <laughs> uh, I can I can deal with this. <laughs> is there is there anything that you would change? Anything that you would tweak on the recipe? Not really. I mean it 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 seems to me like we set out to brew this beer and then you brewed it. You know. Mm. Um, I mean, if if I were to change anything, it would be, you know, I would be changing the the specifications to to be more what you know exactly what I want, not what we were trying to do. Mm. I think if I were to change anything, it would be to brew a full five gallons. <laughs> yeah, instead of just a half a batch, because uh, this would be something that I would love to have on tap. Um, even though having the extra carbonation. You know, my beers are generally not this carbonated coming off the keg, um, so sure. so bottle conditioning in that in that uh, instance uh, would be a good thing. So so you know yeah. maybe I would still bottle and prime it in the way that I primed it. Um, so just yeah, just more. I just want more of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and maybe you know with a full size batch, I would. Uh, step up to you know a packet of of imperial um, because I you know I I don't want to like I say I was trying to under pitch and I you know I don't want to get myself into a situation where I'm trying to like pitch just a portion of a packet of imperial and trying to like right. save the rest it's too good when I do things I like to make them needlessly complicated <laughs> so I might brew five gallons of this and then reserve three gallons of it as is. And then dilute the remaining two gallons to three gallons to have a, like a lower gravity after gardening beer. Oh. And then just drink that one quickly. Oh, yeah. Two kinds of beers from, you know, essentially the same beer, but it's a strength variant. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how this would this beer would react to uh, maybe adding some fruit. Yeah, probably pretty good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yay. I'm yeah. happy. I'm happy because the previous two batches, uh, I I was less happy with, and I screwed up in the process. And I was just like, "Am I losing my touch? Uh, you know, am I just like losing the ability to to have a flawless brew day?" But this one came out. I you know I had, didn't have any problem, and the beer came out well. So yay! It's a confidence builder. Talking about a beer that I can easily screw up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I challenged you to uh, to come on the show and uh, help me formulate a hoppy raw ale, uh, sort of along the lines that uh, Mika Leitinen, uh, author of Viking Age Brew, and I talked about uh, a few weeks ago on the show. Uh, we He talked about techniques, about how he brews his hoppy raw ales. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And then, you know, I want to get together with you and and sort of hone in on ingredients of how I can actually put those techniques to work. So do you do you have a background with with raw ales? Have you ever brewed a raw ale? I haven't. And I, I'm I'm interested in, in reading his his book. Um, but I did several years ago. I found uh, there was a book published in 1969 uh, by a Norwegian called Odd Nordling. And it was, it was like beer and Norwegian brewing techniques, and it was a review of sort of the history uh, of of Norsk brewing up to that point, and you know a lot of things because I read uh, I read his his blog post uh, Mika Mita right yeah I read his blog post and it reminded me a lot of the stuff that cropped up in Odd Nordling's book because they had. Um, I mean, for a long time in Norway, uh, brewing was something that people did on on each each farm had had its own you know little brewing room where a uh, well, malting and brewing room, and they had uh, you know they they brewed with whatever they had available uh, uh, you know the if they were growing oats you know that time then well their their beer's gonna have a lot of oats in it you know um, and yeah it's interesting a lot of a lot of what I read in his blog post uh was, was stuff that i'd seen in uh odd nordland's book you know filtering the mash through uh juniper hmm. Hmm. you know branches and, and stuff stuff like that yeah i think um i mean this is you know these are techniques that have been around for generations um and of course you know since since we're just now discovering them they're new <laughs> yeah <laughs> we tend to have a habit we meaning <laughs> yeah, under the big umbrella, we uh, we have a habit of doing that. Um, so, you know, these raw ales, and and I encourage y'all to go back and listen if you haven't heard the the interview with uh, um, with Mika Leighton and on hoppy raw ales. You know, go back in the archives for some background because we delve very deeply into you know some of the things that we're just going to kind of hit the high points here in this conversation, um, but. The other day, Steve Wilkes and I met at um, West Mountain Brewing on the square uh, to have lunch and have a beer uh, at lunch. And then uh, Ben Mills from Fossil Cove uh, Brewing was there. And then John from West Mountain, the owner of West Mountain, was there. And talk about day drinking. We uh, (laughs) – and solving the world's problems. (laughs) Uh, We might have had some delicious beers there sitting at the bar. And and one of the things I brought up to them was, you know, next beer I want to brew is is raw ale. And both uh, Ben and John kind of went, oh, you know, like, they were very skeptical on the whole raw ale thing, Uh, you know, which is understandable. It's, it's, you know, traditional uh, now to – to boil your beer and people who, you know, boil their beers all the time, they are kind of, you know, skeptical of this kind of thing. So, right. So why would you, what does a boil bring to the process? I mean, why would you actually want to boil your beer uh, as, as opposed to just collecting your wort and pitching some yeast into it? Well, you know, a a standard brewing text is, is going to list several reasons to, to brew or, or, or to boil your wort. Uh, you know the wort should be sanitized. Uh, it it condenses the wort and, and increases the specific gravity a bit. It isomerizes the alpha acids. Um, it, it coagulates proteins, which are insoluble, and then they precipitate out. It also makes protein tannin. Uh, tannins are kind of polyphenol, polyphenol, not polyphenol. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're insoluble, and they precipitate out. And you know. Uh, it decreases the pH uh, when you're mashing. You know your uh, mash settles into a pH is you know somewhere from 5.2 to 5.6. After the boil, it's usually down around five. And then there's other things like it drives off volatiles. It develops some colors, and you know probably other things. But those are those are the biggies. Yeah, and and one thing that that uh, I talked about Mika with is it volatilize boiling volatilizes. DMS precursors, so right. that your so that your beer doesn't taste corny or vegetally, um, you know. Afterwards, uh, and Mika's um, assertion was that if you don't let your wort get up to a certain temperature, 
then those DMS precursors aren't created in the first place, so therefore you don't need to boil them off. So he said that uh, a lot of people who are doing, quote-unquote, raw ales, one mistake that they might do is to collect the wort and give it a quick boil, uh, you know, to accomplish some of the things that, you know, you just listed – Mm-hmm. But it, but in doing that, if they don't boil long enough, they've created those DMS precursors, and now they're going to get a corny, uh, you know, vegetally beer because they didn't boil it long enough or strong enough to drive those off. Um, so, have you heard anything about that? Um, one thing I always think about DMS is, you know, uh, in the past, uh, homebrew, uh, you know, sources made a big deal out of it, but. A lot of malts don't really have a lot of DMS or, you know, don't have the materials that turn into the DMS precursor. Hmm. Um, And, you know, like if you have a British pale ale malt, yeah, you're not you're going to have to work hard to get DMS out of that. If you have a very pale like lager malt, Pilsner malt, something like that. Yeah, maybe. Um, But it's generally it and it could be wrong. But to me, it's generally uh much less of a, a problem with modern malts. I mean I, I've literally never had a homebrew of mine with DMS in it. Mm. And I, I've brewed enough beers sloppily that you know <laughs> <laughs> if it was a if it was a problem that could crop up, I would have encountered it at some point. Yeah, one of the, one beer that you know I I was talking to Ben from Fossil Cove years ago. I was gonna do a no chill uh Pilsner. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know he was like, oh, you're going to get a lot of DMS. And so I didn't. You know, I had a healthy boil. Um, it might even have boiled for 90 minutes, I don't know, at that point. And then, you know, ran the hot word off into the, the no-chill container, pitched the yeast the next day. And it didn't – it wasn't corny. It didn't It didn't have a DMS uh, issue. So I guess that's the closest I've come, <laughs> theoretically. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's, I guess it's not impossible because – is it Rolling Rock the one that's – yeah. yeah, isn't it? That's yeah. the Rolling Rock is like loaded with that, so they're able to, you know, purposely because that's part of their flavor profile, generate that. <laughs> so you know, it's not it's not like it, you know that's completely not worth thinking about. But you know, it's also I, I think it's over if you if you don't want it, I think it's overblown to worry about it too much in, unless you're using the the palest sort of pilsner malts and, and doing you know something wrong. Now, there are a couple of things that I think are challenging uh, in in my mind in designing a recipe for a hoppy raw ale. And one of those is, you know, condensation. As you mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, you collect your wort and then you boil it uh, to get rid of some of the water to increase the gravity. You know, we're not going to have that. Um, you know, he, uh, Mika... Um, encourages, you know, doing an extended recirculated mash, um, like two hours, mm-hmm. <clears throat> two hours at, you know, standard sacrification sac- uh, temperature, maybe 148, you know, maybe 150, and then doing a mash out, you know, raising the temperature of that up to, say, 170 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, sure. So you, so you, during that extended mash and extended recirculation, Hopefully you're 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 harvesting those sugars, um, but you're not you're not able to concentrate what you collect. You know what you get is what you get. Uh, right. So, so you have to formulate the recipe so that your mash your mash runnings and if you're recircling the whole work, they're all going to be uniform unless you sparge. Right. But you need that you need your that to be your that's your pre boil and post boil. <laughs> right. Volume. right. Well, because there's no boil. Yeah. Right. Right. And then the second challenge is isomerization, you know, because you're not boiling, you're not boiling those alpha acids in the hops. Uh, so you're not given that opportunity to create that, that, the bitterness. And the solution to that w- is to uh, do a separate uh, hop tea and boil, actually boil your hops in water you know, separate from your, your mashing technique. So, you know, to say it's completely no boil is not accurate because there is some boiling going on, but you're not boiling your wort. You're just boiling right. this hop tea, uh, which which reminds me, I don't know if you remember, the very first episode of Basic Brewing Video was back in 2005, 
And it was Steve Wilkes and me sitting on the set of our Stepping Into All Grain DVD uh, mm-hmm. doing the very first small batch experiment uh, based on uh, – and the, the experiment was, is boiling hops in plain water bad? Um, and I thought – I talked to – you and to John Palmer, and I think you both had similar responses in saying that you were afraid that if you boil hops in just plain water, that it would give you sort of grassy off flavors. Uh, so that that experiment was to brew two, you know, half gallon batches of beer, essentially, uh, one where some of the the hops were boiled for a period of time. Uh, in just plain water, the other where the boil took place, you know, with the extract added. Um, and we didn't get grassy off flavors, but there was definitely a difference in the in the bitterness character. The the uh, character of the of the hops boiled in just plain water, there was a sharper bitterness. Um, but anyway, that's a little, little trip in the Wayback Machine to our very first uh, video episode. Um, uh, um, alpha acid isomeration is affected by pH. Mm. The the higher the pH, the more al- alpha acids are extracted. So you would expect if you boiled them in wort, you know, with pH, you know, between 5.2 and 5, uh, that you get a lower amount. But in just plain water, you'd get more alpha acids, but more, uh, more harsh. Right, right. So there and you I, go. There back you go. in the day, I, you know, I had the idea of wanting to prime beers with, with like a hop tea kind of you know hop extract and what i came up with as a as a uh solution was boil the hops in, in a little bit of wort like you know it you know basically uh water and you know like a couple pinches of malt extract it doesn't have to be that much you know make a make a gravity of 10 10 or something like that mm-hmm. uh but that's enough to you know the ph down so boil that and then i just poured it all into a french press and you could press, you know, the solids down to the bottom and, and pour off the liquid. And that worked pretty well. Yeah. In fact, I, I remember that conversation. I think I, I bought a French press coffee maker because of that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Because <laughs> it was a couple months ago. So we, Susan was like, look, you know, cleaning out the kitchen cabinets. It was like, what is it? Why do we have this? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that thing. <laughs> It's because of Colby. That's why I have that. <laughs> so, so those, you know, those, so those are the biggest challenges that I can think of in designing this this recipe. So, I'm I'm thinking of doing like a smash beer, um, mm. with some like some interesting base malt, and then you know a fun you know delicious you know like American hop. What do you, what do you think about that? Sure. <laughs> it's your beer, whatever. <laughs> I mean, can you think of any? I mean, re- depending on what you mean by interesting base malt, like in a smash beer, so you want a single malt, right? Single hop. Yeah. So I mean, you could go with a, you know, you could look around amongst the various British, uh, you know, pale ale malts, which are a little bit darker than pale malts. Uh, something like a Vienna. There's you know a few different kinds of Vienna on the market. Something like that would. You know, both give you a little bit of color because you're not developing any color in the boil. And also, you know, those those are guaranteed not to have any, de- you know, or, or I don't know, guaranteed not to. But the, <laughs> the possibility of DMS becoming a problem and those is just greatly decreased due to a straight pale malt. So, yeah, something like that would be cool. Like a Vienna malt. Yeah, um, Vienna. I love Vienna malt. Yeah. And then um, so if I'm, you know, I'm, I've got my high gravity warthog system. And it's a brew in a bag, uh, but it does have a recirculating pump. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm essentially using the grain bed, uh, you know, as a, as a filter. Right. So, but depending on how much grain we call for, I'm going to have to compensate for some, you know, for some of that that water that we specify being locked up in the mash right. and not coming out. Right. And I don't plan on sparging any more, you know, like adding fresh water on top of what I got. Yeah, you shouldn't. That's not going to work out with this beer. So, so 
Maybe we should start out with you know how much how much base malt like like Vienna. Let's let's say I'm going to do uh, Vienna malt. Um, what's your uh, what's your batch volume? Let's do five five gallons. Five gallons. Typically, on a five gallon batch, I start out with eight gallons of water or thirty liters of water. Um, right. And just use all the you know since it's brewing a bag, I just use all the water at once. I uh, don't add any wa more water in the process. So should I start off instead of eight gallons, maybe, you know, and then I, I, usually I squeeze the bag also, which, you know, uh, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to uh, extract, uh, you know, I don't want to undo the work that I did from, you know, filtering the wort through the grain um, by squeezing Th that grain, yeah. So, so what? How? Well, what, what volume of water should I start out with, or or well, what? Or what grain? How much grain should we start out with? There, yeah. There are two things here: how much grain, and then how much water. And I think it helps to remember that um, malt absorbs about a liter of water for every kilogram of grain, which works out to about a half a quart. Per pound, so we could you know start with start with that, you know figure out how much grain would get us to, you know whatever volume whatever mash volume of that is, and then figure out, you know okay but, you know this amount is lost, and then figure out how much more water to add. So maybe we should start out with a grain because we because the gravity yeah. you know the gravity is is going to be important. Yeah. First off. So should we, you know, if I'm, if on a typical pale ale, you know, I would do like 10 pounds of base malt. Right. Should I do like 12? Yeah, that's, that's a starting point. Let's try that. <laughs> just, to, just to compensate, you know, to add some gravity to that. And, you know, this is, this is a, an experiment. So, you know, I don't, I have a fairly, a fairly wide range for a target. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so if I so if I have a you know kind of a lower gravity session pale ale, I'm fine with it. You know, if I if I have a you know higher gravity pale, ale, you know, you know, it, I'm I'm just going to take collect some data with this one and see right. see what happens. On my calculator, twelve pounds of Vienna malt in, in a typically made five gallon batch would be ten sixty three. Right, but that's with sparged wort and and, and a, a you know boiling off and a, a a gallon right um if we have 12 pounds of wort times a half a quart 12 pounds of grain. per pound then we lose six quarts which is a gallon and a half right yeah and I probably want to get oh, yeah. I probably want to get like six gallons into the fermenter don't you I mean because you know right. to allow for a trube yeah. So start with like seven and a half gallons uh, of water to begin with. That seems like a lot. Yeah, it does. If I usually start it's out also, with eight. <laughs> if we go to, if our mash thickness is two quarts of water per pound of grain, which is fairly thin. I mean, it's within the doable range. That gives us six gallons, well, or six gallons of uh, mash total. Take off a gallon and a half of that, and that's five and a half, blah, 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 five and a half gallons of wort. That should be pretty good for a five gallon batch. That's more than enough to take care of troop and stuff like that. So, what, and then that should be at a. Am I thinking about this right? It should be at a sixty three. So yeah. So if we're, so if we're starting with twelve pounds of Vienna malt, twelve pounds of Vienna malt, uh, six gallons, six gallons of strike water, mm. six. That seems. Or no, is that right? That yeah, six gallons of water. So then, the, oh, the mash would be. Yeah, the mash would be more than that, in terms of, but it's but still six gallons of water, or or twenty three liters, and then we'd lose a gallon and a half of the water. Yeah, that yeah, seems. So we might, six. It's seems, hard to tell. Six seems low. What if we What if we compromise? I mean, because yeah. because again, yeah, volume. Than... You know, <laughs> gravity and volume of my beer. Yeah, those those are variables inverse. that I'm not stuck on. You know, I'm not putting a pen in anything saying that I must have this. Right. 
So maybe it, what if what if I just try seven gallons of water? You know, I put okay. seven gallons of water in the in the kettle, and then okay. I, and then I mash in twelve pounds of Vienna malt, and I just recirculate that. You know, at at a hundred and forty eight for a couple hours. You know, get that wort nice and thin, so that it runs out right. easily, and then ramp it up. <laughs> You know, for a mash out, for like, how long should I do a mash out at 100, say 170? Like, like mash out can be very short. You know, 50. five minutes is more than enough. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, a mash out is yeah. But but I want to make uh, I whatever make... it's supposed to accomplish. Usually, making uh, will stop enzyme activity and uh, just uh, you know making the wort a bit more or, or no a bit less. Uh, what's the word? Viscous. Viscous. Yeah. Yeah. That's not huh? okay. Doesn't take long. Okay. It yeah, might, and it if you, might if you a... add seven gallons of water to twelve pounds of malt, that's a mash thickness of two point three quarts, uh, quarts per pound, or or one point eight liters per kilogram, and that's that's at the top end of what. You, you, but then if you mash for a long time, yeah, it should be fine. Totally fine. Okay. Yeah, long mash would be good because Vienna malt, the diastatic power of Vienna malt is less than that of pale malts. But then, a long, a long mash should overcome both fat and the, and the thin mash. Okay. And so for our bittering hops that we're going to boil in, uh, in water. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm I'm assuming like a couple of quarts of water would be fine. Um, and by water you mean wort, right? Well, I guess I could. Well, I I mean theoretically I could run the I could run the uh run the mash for 30 minutes or something just to get some you know some, yeah. like a thin wort going and then yeah, like, like, yeah. and then just, you know, like, like half a cup of wort, yeah, and put put, put, a, that in put with a, a liter of water and put a yeah. pot underneath the uh spray thingy and collect, you know, a pot of water or a pot of wort just to, for a buffer. Yeah. And then how much, and you don't even need, you don't even need full strength wort. I mean, I would collect like half a cup of, of wort and then, Oh, and then, you know, it... put it in a liter of water. To, oh, okay. To make, oh. mix units. Yeah, that's a good point. But, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so how much, let's see, say if we have cascade, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so like, like, I like Cascade. An ounce, <laughs> an ounce of is an is an ounce of Cascade enough for you know to, for bittering for this? Because what what I'm going to do is that's gonna... a, a very low that that gives us like that gives us like eighteen or nineteen IBUs. Okay, so so a couple ounces of Cascade, two ounces, yeah, and boil that on boil that for like an hour on the stove for our bittering. Yeah. And then, and, and that then should get us. Yeah, and, that should get us to about thirty, thirty six, thirty seven IBUs. And which then, is, you know, and then I, I can pour that. According to Mika, I can just pour that on top of the of the mash, you know, and just let that recirculate for, that. for the for the second hour. Again, this is an experiment. Yeah, uh, or you could, or you could pour it on the mash, right at the very end, so that you retain some of the aroma. Although, I mean, you've already boiled it for an hour. Yeah. Where, where but we're you gonna, can put some aroma hops. Yeah, where, what we're going to right where, at the end of that. Where we're going to get our aroma is that I'm going to put uh, hops into a bag in the brew bucket as I'm collecting my wort. Okay. So so at the end of the sure. of the mash out, you know, we're going to have 170 degree uh, wort, and I'll run it off into the um, into the bucket. Um, because you know it's be easier to collect, you know, pull those hops out. So it's a, it's either first word hopping or uh, dip hopping, depending on, because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you're you're going into the fermenter with hot wort, and so I can do a hop stand there, um, mm-hmm. you know, with like what a couple ounces, a couple more ounces of uh, Cascade, yeah, uh, for. You know, as long as it takes to collect that wort and maybe, you know, for a total time of, what, 15 minutes, something like that? Sure. 
uh, and then take those out. And then I want to uh, get my hands on some Imperial Pog, which is a Quebec strain, mm -hmm. uh, and then ferment. I don't know how hot my porch is going to be by the time I get <laughs> to brew this beer. Uh, but, you know, for, for a minute, you know, it's warm. Um, so Are you going to ch chill the word at some point? Yeah, I I can put the immersion would... chiller into the bucket. That's another reason yeah. to use a bucket. there you go. Uh, put the immersion chiller into the bucket, chill that down to, say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, around 37C, uh, pitch the pog, and then, you know, let it go. Um and then I guess I could taste the, you know, after fermentation, I could taste, you know, a sample of the beer to see if I want to dry hop it. You should build a time machine, <laughs> go back in time to a homebrew conference and tell people you're going to pitch beer at 100 degrees F and just <laughs> look at everyone, have a heart attack or come <laughs> to lecture you on how stupid you are. <laughs> yeah, I know. Excuse me. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But but again, you know, Scandinavians have been doing this for generations. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe when Crazy. you're maybe when your your genes were still in uh, in that area of the world, they were still you know they were pitching hot hot uh, wort. Uh, so, uh, I think that's good. I think we have a I think we have a plan, and we'll just I will just collect data, mm -hmm. and uh, you know see what the actual results are and then you know it'll be a learning experience to you know to see what my system does in that circumstance and we can come back and you know advise people on you know how to approach the thing yeah well it sounds like a, i mean an interesting i'm not that into smash beers but this is an interesting one you know vienna i think is a very versatile malt and you know especially given that we aren't going to boil it where, you know, typically a little bit of, uh, you know, melanoidins are produced in the boil. Uh, you know, in this case, the the, mal the maltsters will have made those for us. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and then, I don't know. I'm, I'm an old-timer. I still love Cascade Ops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, too. Yeah, we know Cascade yeah. Ops, sonny. Yeah, I dog got it. Uh, I wish those teenagers would get off my lawn. Who who needs guava and honeydew? You know, we, yeah. we just got old plain old grapefruit. <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is a good. I think this is a really good recipe to to you know to try out and, and uh, with this concept. Um, yeah. And I think it's going to be a, f a fun brew day. Sounds uh, like it. Also, it should be a fairly short brew day because I mean you'd well. Yeah, I got it. Well, you skip the boil, but you have an extended. Okay, so you're not extended mash. You're not really saving time because you're ex extended mash, right? But I mean, you should, you know, doesn't doesn't take much. If you've got, I assume you're recirculating via a pump. Yes. So you can just sit there and I yeah. don't know, drink drink beer maybe. Yeah. Just, an, just <laughs> yeah. an idea. It's not a hard brew day for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and I'll send you some. Nice. When it's done. And I'll, I'll send you a text that says something raw is headed your way. Something and, raw is headed your way. <laughs> and then you'll respond and I'll put it on Instagram. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, it's time for us to turn off the machine and, and have another beer. <laughs> yes. It's very important. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Many thanks to Chris. Will he like the Hoppy Raw Ale as much as the single? Only time will tell. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us for our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. Mm -hmm.